trying to summarize the view of the world given by the secularist appropriation of science, now common in Western culture. Simon Blackburn describes things this way. He says, the cosmos is some 15 billion years old, almost unimaginably huge, and governed by natural laws that will compel its extinction in some billions more years. Although long before that, the Earth and the solar system will have been destroyed by the heat death of the sun. Human beings occupy an infinitesimally small fraction of space and time on the edge of one galaxy among a hundred thousand million or so galaxies. We evolved only because of a number of cosmic accidents. Nature shows us no particular favors. We get parasites and diseases and we die. And we are not all that nice to each other. True, we are moderately clever, but our efforts to use our intelligence quite often backfire. That, more or less, is the scientific picture of the world. I'm going to call a view such as this a secularist scientific picture, or SSP for short, to distinguish this view from a mere summary of contemporary scientific data. It remains a widely held picture of the world, even though, as I'm going to show in what follows, research in various areas is making inroads against some parts of this view. On SSP, as I will understand it for purposes of this lecture, the natural laws Blackburn refers to are typically taken to be the laws of physics, and all other laws are supposed to be somehow explainable in terms of the natural laws of physics. All things in the world are thought to be reducible to the fundamental units of matter postulated by physics and governed by the natural laws of physics. One important presupposition of SSP is a metaphysical rather than a scientific principle. As philosophers would put it, the principle that constitution is identity. That is, for anything made out of parts, that thing is identical to the parts that are its constituents. There is nothing to a whole other than the sum of its parts. And of course, the same holds for each of the parts. Each part is also nothing more than the sum of its parts, and so on down to the most fundamental level. Ultimately, everything is identical to the most fundamental parts that constitute it. On SSP, these are the elementary particles governed by the natural laws of physics. The metaphysics incorporating the principle that constitution is identity is one version of reductionism. As one philosopher, Robert Hen Robin Hendley, puts it, the reductionist slogan is that x is reducible to y just in case x is nothing but its reductionist base y. The appeal to reductionism of this sort was greatly enhanced by scientific developments in the 20th century, especially in molecular biology and genetics. Describing the growth in adherence to reductionism in consequence of these scientific developments, Cynthia and Graham MacDonald say this. They say, the use of chemical theories in all these developments in biology was crucial, suggesting that biology was reducible to chemistry and thereby to physics given that the reducibility of chemistry to physics was thought to have been demonstrated by the physical explanation of chemical bonding. The major trend in all of this scientific work was to explain processes at the macro level by discovering more of the detail of microprocesses. So reductionism looked to be an eminently suitable research strategy. Reductionism of this sort is often thought to rest on another metaphysical claim as well, namely the claim that there's causal closure at the level of physics. That is, apart from quantum indeterminacy, it seems to some people that there's a complete causal story to be told about everything that happens, and that complete causal story takes place at the level of the elementary particles described by physics. On the view of natural laws in SSP, then, any causality found at the macro level is just a function of the causality to be found at the micro level of physics. 
Because on this view there's causal closure at the lowest level, the causal interactions among the fundamental particles of a thing are not open to interference by anything which is not itself at the most fundamental level and governed by the natural laws operating on that level. Everything that happens at any higher level, from the chemical to the psychological, happens as it does just because of the causal interactions among the fundamental physical particles involved. So, for example, any act of a human being is explained by events at the level of bodily <coughs> organs and tissues. These are explained by events at the level of cells. These are explained by events at the level of molecules. These are explained by events at the level of atoms, and so on, down to the lowest level at which there are the causal interactions among the elementary particles postulated by physics and governed by the natural laws of physics. The causal interactions of things at this lowest level thus account for everything else that happens, including those things human beings do. Or to put the point of this picture in a more provocative way, on SSP, Love and fidelity, creativity, the very achievements of science, and any other thing that makes human life admirable or desirable is itself just the result of the causal interactions of elementary particles in accordance with the natural laws of physics. Every human act is, governed, is determined by the causal interactions of elementary particles governed by these natural laws, and even the belief that SSP is correct is so determined. SSP has so strong a hold on some contemporary philosophers that they see no alternative to holding that all mental states are causally determined by the physical states of the brain, which are in turn causally determined by causal interactions at that very lowest level. To philosophers in the grip of SSP, libertarian free will can seem impossible, since neural states are part of a causal chain that is determined by causal interactions at the level of the microphysical, and there's causal closure at that lowest level. Not only states of the will, but in fact all mental states, considered as mental, seem just causally inert. It's not surprising, then, that as regards freedom of the will, Philosophers who accept something like SSP tend also to accept compatibilism, the theory that a will of a human person can be both free and also causally determined. Compatibilism appears to be a sort of corollary to the scientific picture that embraces reductionism and causal closure at the microphysical level. If all macro phenomena are reducible to microstructural phenomena, and if there's a complete causal story to be told at the micro level, then whatever control or freedom we have as macroscopic agents has to be not only compatible with, but in fact just is, a function of the complete causal story at the micro level. For many people, me included, the implications of SSP seem highly counterintuitive. Is everything really completely determined by causal interactions at the microphysical level? Could it really be that the mental states of a person are causally inert as far as his own actions are concerned? Could an act of will really be both free and yet also causally determined? It's instructive to reflect on SSP by contrasting it with the very different view of the world held by the medieval philosopher Aquinas. Aquinas talks about natural law too, but as is well known, the notion of natural law in the thought of Aquinas is nothing like the thought of natural law in SSP. With respect to the notion of natural law in Aquinas' thought, Human persons and human agency are not rendered marginal or even invisible, as they seem to be in SSP. Rather, human persons and human agency are at the center of the discussion. So I want to say just a very few things about natural law in Aquinas' worldview to show you the contrast. When Aquinas explains his notion of natural law, he says that the natural law is a participation on the part of the human person 
in the eternal law in the mind of God. And when he explains that eternal law, he says that it is the ordering of all created things as that ordering is determined in the mind and will of the Creator. For a created person to participate in the eternal law of God, then, is for that person to have a mind and will which reflect their origin in the Creator. The natural law in created human persons is an analog of the eternal law in the mind of God. The ordering of creation in the eternal law includes all the organization of the created world, but it is the moral ordering that is at the heart of the natural law. A human person's intellect has enough of the light of reason to be able to discern what is good and what is evil, and a human will has enough natural inclination to follow reason's light. So the natural law in a created person is a participation in the creator in two ways. First, by way of knowledge about good and evil. And secondly, by way of an inward principle in the will that moves to action in accordance with the deliverances of the intellect. Aquinas also describes law in general as an ordinance of reason for the common good which is made by the person who has the care of the community and which is promulgated. So a question arises for Aquinas whether natural law is also promulgated. And in reply, he says that the natural law is promulgated just in virtue of the creator's instilling it into a created person, in the intellect as a matter of natural knowledge, and in the will as an innate inclination for the good. Even so, Aquinas thinks, the will is master of itself and free. Contrary to the compatibilist account of free will, typically taken to be implied by SSP, for Aquinas, the will is free in the strong sense that nothing, not even the intellect, not even God, acts on the will with efficient causation. Although the general precepts derived from the divinely implanted habit of knowledge in the intellect can't be totally wiped out, Secondary precepts derived from these general precepts can be blotted out by human moral evil. And even the application of the most general precepts to particular actions can be hindered by the effects of moral evil on a person's <coughs> intellect. Aquinas makes an analogous point as regards the natural inclination to act in accordance with the good. He argues that even the natural inclination to the good can be undermined by human evil. In the wicked, not only is the natural knowledge of the good corrupted by the passions and morally evil habits, but also, he says, the natural inclination to virtue is corrupted by the habits of vice. So one way to understand Aquinas' account of natural law is that for Aquinas, natural law is a gift of the creator to human persons he's created. It consists in a pair of habits, one in the will and one in the intellect, which is given to human beings either by means of the innate light of reason or through the creator's revelation of his own mind to his creatures. Although these gifts are implanted, they are so far in the control of the creature that a person's exercise of his free will and evil acts can corrupt them. So nothing about God's rendering the natural law innate in human persons takes away from human persons their free agency. That's a very fast summary of Aquinas on natural law, with many bits that need further discussion. But this is what I want to say about that brief summary. Just as many people find the implications of SSP counterintuitive, so, for many people, the implications of Aquinas' account of natural law, grounded as it is in his theology, those implications seem highly counterintuitive, too. Can everything in the world really be traced back to an omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good creator? Could it really be the case that a human person has the causal powers of intellect and will that reflect the eternal law in the mind of the creator? Or to put the same question in a less theological way, could the action of something at the macro level, such as a human being, exercise causality from the top down, as it were, without being itself causally determined at the micro level. Could it really be, for example, 
that human beings have free will in a libertarian sense. Any attempt to hold in one view the very different notions of natural law in SSP and in the worldview of Aquinas can result in vertigo. They're dizzyingly different, these two pictures. How is one to understand the differences in worldview between the two? And how could one even begin to adjudicate their competing claims or the competing accusations of being counterintuitive? It's profitable to begin by considering their highly various metaphysics. As has often been remarked, one notable difference between the notion of natural law in SSP and the Thomistic notion of natural law is that for Aquinas, but not for SSP, natural law is the law of a lawgiver, whose mind is the source of the law, and whose care for other persons leads him to promulgate the law. On the view of natural law in SSP, by contrast, the whole notion of law is only metaphorical. A natural law of physics is a generalization describing the nature of the world at the microphysical level. It's not prescriptive, it's not promulgated, and it's not the result of an act of intellect and will on the part of a lawgiver. <coughs> This dissimilarity in the notion of law is, of course, correlated with a much greater difference as regards the ultimate foundation of reality. On SSP, the ultimate foundation of reality consists in those elementary particles described by the ultimately correct version of contemporary physics and by the causal interactions among them governed by the natural laws of that completed physics. And everything else that there is is reducible to the elementary particles composing it. Persons are no exceptions to this claim. Persons, too, are reducible to the elementary particles that constitute them. So at the ultimate foundation of all reality, there is only the non-personal. What is challenging for SSP, therefore, is the construction of the personal out of the non-personal. The mental states of persons, their free agency, their relations with each other, all have to be understood somehow as built out of the physically determined interaction of the non-personal. On Aquinas' view, things are exactly the other way around. That is because for Aquinas, the ultimate foundation of reality is God the Creator, who consists in the three persons of the Trinity. <laughs> Now, I do understand that on the doctrine of the Trinity, the word person is used in a technical sense. But even on that technical sense, each person of the Trinity has mind and will. And so it is also true that each member of the Trinity counts as personal in our ordinary sense of person, which is uh, something characterized by mind and will. Here's the important point I want to make on this score. On the doctrine of the Trinity, none of the persons of the Trinity is reducible to anything non-personal. That is, it's not the case that the persons of the Trinity are reducible to the Godhead, or to being qua being, or to anything else at all. So on the Thomistic worldview, the ultimate foundation of reality is precisely persons. It wouldn't be hard, I think, to trace the notable differences between SSP and Aquinas' worldview, as implied by their differing notions of natural law, back to the great dissimilarity in their metaphysical views regarding the ultimate foundation of reality. But given this radical difference between SSP and the Thomistic worldview, as regards such foundational matters, is it so much as possible to reason about their competing claims? Of course, people who are very much in the grip of SSP might suppose that there's no point in trying to do so. For them, an evaluative comparison of the two different pictures of the world isn't worth the effort. The Thomistic view of the ultimate foundation of reality is no longer a live option, and no doubt, those committed to a Thomistic worldview return the compliment as regards SSP, which is a not a live option for them either. Nonetheless, even in the face of this great divide, 
I want to see what can be done by way of an evaluative comparison. And I want to do so without addressing the question of the existence of God. The recent history of philosophy makes us pessimistic about the prospects of success when it comes to arguing with each other over the existence of God. But even if that weren't so, it's clear that it wouldn't be profitable in a short lecture like this to tackle a disagreement of that magnitude head on. Nonetheless, it is possible to say something to evaluate these two differing worldviews with regard to one somewhat smaller metaphysical issue, and that is the issue of reductionism. The brief sketch I gave of Aquinas' views make it clear that Aquinas' metaphysics is incompatible with reductionism, unlike SSP, which is committed to it. As I explained at the outset of this lecture, reductionism has come under increasing attack in recent years, in science as well as in philosophy. In what follows, I'm going to sketch just a little of this attack. And I'm going to argue that the rejection of reductionism it supports is correct. And then I won't argue, but I will only suggest, that such a rejection of reductionism is much more at home in a worldview such as that of Aquinas, which sees the ultimate foundation of reality as personal. So let's have a look at reductionism. Although reductionism comes in many different forms, they share a common attitude. Reductionism holds that ultimately all scientific explanation can be formulated in terms of the microstructural. That's one reason why reductionism is often taken to imply a commitment to causal closure at the microphysical level. One way to understand reductionism, then, is that it ignores or discounts the importance of levels of organization. Levels of organization is the way we talk today. Aquinas' term for this, taken from Aristotle, would have been not levels of organization, but form, hylomorphic form, and the causal efficacy of things in virtue of their hylomorphic form. This feature of reductionism, that it ignores levels of organization or form, this feature helps explain why reductionism has come under special attack in philosophy of biology. Biological function is frequently a feature of the way in which the microstructural components of a thing are organized, not of the intrinsic properties of the microcomponents themselves. Consider protein, for example. Proteins tend to be biologically active only when folded in certain ways, so that their function depends on their three-dimensional structure. But this three-dimensional structure is a feature of the organization of the protein molecule as a whole. It can't be reduced to the properties of the elementary particles that make up the atoms of the molecule. In fact, for large proteins, even an omniscient knowledge of the properties of the elementary particles of the atoms that comprise the protein wouldn't be enough to predict the structure of the folded protein, because the activity of enzymes is required to catalyze the folding of the components of the molecule in order for the protein to have its biologically active role. In his magisterial attack on reductionism, taken from the perspective of philosophy of biology, the atheistic philosopher John Dupre takes the examples in his argument against reductionism from ecology and population genetics, not from molecular biology. He summarizes his rejection of reductionism this way. He says, on reductionist views, events at the macro level, except insofar as they are understood as aggregates of events at the micro level, that is, as reducible to the micro level, they're causally inert. But there are genuinely causal entities at many different levels of organization. And this is enough to show that causal completeness at one particular level, the micro level, is wholly incredible. In philosophy of science, as Dupre's remarks illustrate, arguments against reductionism 
have frequently been directed against the possibility of reducing the biological to the physical. But analogous arguments can be used to undermine even the project of reducing the chemical to the physical. So consider, for example, the chirality or handedness of a molecule. The same constituents of a molecule can form different chiral analogs, or as they're called, enantiomers, depending on whether those very same constituents are organized in a left-handed form or a right-handed form. It turns out that enantiomers of the very same molecule can behave differently. For example, different enantiomers of organophosphates, which are a mainstay of insecticides, have radically different toxicities for freshwater invertebrates. So if you're a great chemical company and you test for the ecological safety of one enantiomer, you can get very misleading results about the safety of your insecticide. You've got to check for the other enantiomer as well. Each enantiomer has its own form or organization, and the carbon power of the enantiomer is a function of the configuration of the whole. In a detailed defense of the claim that the chemical can't be reducible to the physical, the philosopher Robin Henry takes as one of his examples ethanol and methoxymethane. He says, these are distinct substances even though each contains carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen in the molar ratio of 2 to 1 to 6. Clearly, the distinctiveness of ethanol and methoxymethane as chemical substances must lie in their different molecular structures, that is, the differing arrangements of the atoms in space. Discussing another of his examples, hydrogen chloride, Henry says, if the acidic behavior of hydrogen chloride is conferred by its asymmetry, and the asymmetry is not conferred by the molecule's physical basis according to physical laws, then ontological reduction fails because the acidity is a causal power which is not conferred by the physical interactions among the parts. In addition to work such as this in the philosophy of biology and the newly developing philosophy of chemistry, there have also been attacks on reductionism in recent work in philosophy of mind and metaphysics. This work has attempted to undermine the credibility of the claim that there's causal closure at the microphysical level. So, for example, Alexander Byrd has argued that a substance is what it is in virtue of having the causal powers the substance has. It couldn't be the substance it is and have different causal powers. For, for philosophers such as Bird, causal powers are vested in substances, they're not vested in events, and all causation is substance causation, not event causation. The constellation of the properties of a substance is another way of picking out what Aquinas would see as the form of the substance. For Bird, then, as for Aquinas, the form of a substance its constellation of properties gives that substance certain capacities for causal power, for acting. A substance can act to exercise the causal power it has in virtue of its form or configuration. And for this reason, a causal chain can be initiated by any substance at any level of organization. And so there can be top-down causation as well as bottom-up causation. One way to think about such recent anti-reductionist moves in philosophy is to see them as adopting a neo-Aristotelian metaphysics of a Thomistic sort. For Aquinas, a thing's configuration or organization, its form, as he would say, is also among the constituent of things, and the function of a thing is consequent on its form. On philosophical views such as these, a thing is not just the sum of its parts, Reductionism fails, and there is not causal closure at the microphysical level. The component parts of a whole can sometimes explain how the whole does what it does, but what the whole does has to be explained as a function of the causal power had by that whole 
in virtue of the form or configuration of the whole. Some contemporary philosophers of mind, such as E.J. Lowe, for example, suppose that similar lessons apply with regard to the mind and to mental states. Like Bird and others, Lowe has argued that genuine causal powers belong only to substances, and that substances have the causal power they do in virtue of the properties or the form of the whole. On Lowe's view, a mental act is an exercise of a causal power had by a human being in virtue of the whole complex organization had by human beings. I think that recent discoveries in neuroscience and developmental psychology suggest that we should go even further in this anti-reductionist direction. These recent neuroscientific and psychological discoveries suggest that in order to understand some human cognitive <coughs> capacity, we need to consider a whole system that comes into existence only when two people are acting in concert with each other. Research some of the deficits of autism have helped to make this clear. Autism, in all its forms, is marked by severe impairment in what some psychologists and philosophers call mind reading. We are now beginning to understand that mind reading is foundational to an infant's ability to learn language or to develop cognitive abilities in other areas as well. For an infant to develop normally, it requires mind reading. The infant's normal system has to be employed within the active functioning of a larger system composed of at least two persons, the infant and the infant's primary caregiver. This system <coughs> employs and requires shared attention, or as we say now, joint attention, between a child and its caregiver. It is not easy to give an analysis of joint attention. Very easy to recognize it, but hard to give an analysis of it. One developmental psychologist, Peter Hobson, says, joint attention occurs when an individual is psychologically engaged with someone else's psychological engagement with him or with the world. Researchers are now inclined to think that there is a foundational deficit in autism which has to do with dyadic shared attention or dyadic joint attention. One scientist says, Dyadic joint attention is the most direct sharing of attention and the most powerful experience of others' attention that one can have. Dyadic shared attention is what we find when mother and infant are looking into one another's eyes. Mutual gaze is one way of having dyadic shared attention. Many lines of research are converging to suggest that autism is most fundamentally an impairment in this capacity for dyadic joint attention. Trying to summarize his own understanding of the role that the lack of dyadic shared attention plays in the development of autism, Hobson says that autism arises because, quote, of a disruption in the system of child in relation to others, unquote. By way of explanation of that funny phrase, Hobson says this. He says, my experience as a researcher of autism has convinced me that such a system of child in relation to others not only exists, but also takes charge of the intellectual growth of the infant. Central to mental development is a psychological system that is greater and more powerful than the sum of its parts. The parts are the caregiver and her infant. The system is what happens when they act and feel in concert. The combined operation of intellect in relation to caregiver is a motive force in development, and it achieves wonderful things. When it does not exist and the motive force is lacking, the whole of mental development is terribly compromised. At the extreme, autism results. On Hobson's views, then, Autism cannot be explained apart from a complex system consisting of two human beings, an infant and the primary caregiver. Any attempt to explain this system in terms of reductionism and causal closure at the microphysical <coughs> level would lose the understanding of the jointness in joint attention, which is critical for normal infant development. 
On the contrary, as the phrase indicates, joint attention cannot be understood even just by reference to one human being taken as a whole, to say nothing of the lowest level components of a human being. Rather, joint attention has to be understood in, in terms of a system comprising two human beings acting together. This system enables the dyadic shared attention, which in turn enables the connection necessary for typical infant development. So, what's the moral of the story? Well, SSP supposes that all macro phenomena are reducible to micro level phenomena and that there's a complete causal story to be told at the micro level. The converging lines of research in the sciences and several areas of philosophy, however, make a good case that reductionism is to be rejected. And if reductionism is rejected, then it is not true that everything is determined by causal interactions at the level of the microphysical. And it is also not the case that things at the macro level are causally inert. Rather, causal power is associated with things at any level of organization in consequence of the configuration or form of those things. For SSP, whatever control or freedom human beings have as agents at the macro level has to be not only compatible with, but in fact dependent on, the complete causal story at the micro level. But if reductionism is rejected, as the new work in philosophy and the sciences suggest it should be, then there can be causal efficacy at various levels of organization, including at the level of human agents. A person's intellect and will can exercise real causal efficacy from the top down, as Aquinas supposes they do. Dupre puts the point this way. He says, there is no reason why changes at one level may not be explained in terms of causal processes at a higher, more complex level. In the case of human action, the physical changes involved in and resulting from a particular action may perfectly well be explained in terms of the capacity of the agent to perform an action of that sort. He can take this position because having rejected reductionism, he's free to hold, as he says, that human beings have all kinds of causal capacities that nothing else in our world has. He says there's no good reason for projecting these uniquely human capacities in a reductionist style onto inanimate bits of matter. Nor is there anything ultimately mysterious about particular causal capacities being exhibited uniquely by very complex entities. On views such as Dupre's, there is nothing mysterious about assigning such causal capacity, such causal power to human beings. On the contrary, compatibilism works like an unnecessary concession, an attempt to preserve what we commonly believe about our control over our actions in the face of a mistaken commitment to reductionism. With reductionism rejected in favor of a metaphysics that allows causal power vested in substances at any level of organization, the causality exercised in libertarian free will is one more case of a kind of causation that even a water molecule can manifest. In a metaphysical system of this anti-reductionist sort, the place of persons is not imperiled. In fact, even a human pair bonded in love, as a mother and child are, can be a whole with causal power vested in their bondedness. So where does all this get us? Where does it leave us? This is what I want to say in conclusion. If reductionism is rejected, as the work I've canvassed argues it should be, then with respect to this one issue, this one issue, the Thomistic worldview is more veridical and more worthy of acceptance than SSP is. By itself, of course, this conclusion certainly does not decide the issue as regards the main disagreement between SSP and the Thomistic view. This conclusion can't adjudicate the issue regarding the ultimate foundation of reality. It can't tell us whether or not God exists. 
And so as far as the evidence canvassed in this lecture is concerned, the central disagreement between SSP and the Thomistic view remains an open issue. It is clearly possible to reject reductionism and also accept atheism. John Dupre does that, for example. For that matter, it should be said, it is also possible to reject atheism and accept reductionism. You can be a religious believer and a reductionist. As I've described it, SSP is a secular view that combines contemporary scientific theories with certain metaphysical claims. But it's possible to have an analog to SSP in which a reductionist scientific view of the world is combined with a commitment to religious belief, even religious belief of an orthodox Christian sort. That is, SSP can have a theistic analog, which includes most of the scientific and metaphysical worldview of SSP, but varies that worldview to a belief in an immaterial creator. So consider, for example, Peter Van Inwagen's explanation of God's providence. I'm just about to say something negative about these views of Peter Van Inwagen's, so I need also to tell you that Peter Van Inwagen is my very dear friend, I think he's a terrific philosopher, and I think you should listen to whatever it is he says or writes. I still think, on this one issue, he's wrong. <laughs> Trying to explain God's actions in the created world, Van Inwagen says that God acts by issuing decrees about elementary particles and their causal powers. He says, God's action consists in his issuing a decree of the form let that particle now exist and have such and such causal powers. For Van Nieuwagen, apart from miracles, God's actions in the world consist just in creating and sustaining elementary particles and their causal powers. This, Van Nieuwagen says, is the entire extent of God's causal relations with the created world. And you can see why he would say that if you accept reductionism. Now what I would say is, for most people conversant with religious discourse in the Judeo-Christian tradition, this, re this religious analog to SSP will seem a very odd mix. Could it really be possible, as Van Nienwagen is apparently claiming, that decrees concerning the existence and causal powers of elementary particles exhaust the rich panoply of divine interaction with human persons that Judaism and Christianity have traditionally ascribed to God. Most orthodox adherents to Judaism and Christianity have assumed that God not only creates particles, but that he also creates persons. He doesn't just sustain particles, he sustains persons. <coughs> and he doesn't just issue decrees about particles, he engages in personal interaction with human beings. On this view, God not only issues decrees about particles or anything else, God also cajoles, threatens, instructs, illumines, demands, comforts, and asks questions. At the heart of all these activities is direct interaction between persons. Even if all of that and more could be reduced to decrees about particles, the reduction would have lost the very personal connection that in both Judaism and Christianity has been the most important element in relations between God and human persons. For Van Nienwagen, God interacts directly with particles and thereby indirectly with human persons. Most religious believers have supposed that God acted directly, at least sometimes, with human persons. So what I want to say is that for these reasons, reductionism doesn't fit well with theism. I'm not saying it's incompatible with theism. My point is only that there's something awkward or forced or implausible about reductionism in a theistic worldview. It isn't natural there, you might say. On a worldview that takes persons to be the ultimate foundation of reality, reductionism to the level of elementary particles is not really at home. And here's my point. 
Here's my point in conclusion. One more paragraph and I'm done. By the very same token, it seems to me that the rejection of reductionism is harder to square with a worldview in which the ultimate foundation of reality is impersonal. Here, too, the issue isn't the compatibility of these two positions. I'm not claiming that the rejection of reductionism is incompatible with a worldview in which elementary particles are foundational. The point is rather this. The rejection of reductionism leaves room for the place our ordinary intuitions accord persons in the world. But to me, at any rate, the metaphysics that gives persons this place is much easier to understand and make sense of on a worldview that sees persons as the ultimate foundation of reality. Figuring out how to make this metaphysics cohere with the picture Blackburn paints, even if we subtract reductionism from that picture, strikes me as much harder to do. So that's my conclusion. With that, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for the clarity of that. The first reaction is, I thought there was a bit of a gap in the middle in the way you presented it. An extreme contrast between scientific reductionism on the one hand and the full panoply of Thomas Aquinas on the other. Obviously, there are lots of positions in between, as I think you realize. Um, in particular, a view that human beings can't be reduced to the you know, microphysical structure. We have causal powers and virtue of our beliefs, emotions, choices, and so on, as we obviously agree. Um, that doesn't imply theism. It doesn't take us all the way to theism. Lots of people, as you know, occupy that middle position. Um, and it maybe removes one obstacle to theism, but it doesn't imply it. Yeah, of course I said so. Yes. I mean, you may remember that I said so. Huh? So, so we don't disagree that I said, I said so. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things that I'm kind of wondering about this particular view of uh, downward causation is when I think about the macro state of, say, this particular lecture and the things that you happened to say, I could think that a lot of different micro states, a lot of different arrangements of particles could have brought about this exact same, or at least as far as we could tell, this same sort of macro state with these same sorts of larger qualities. But the reverse seems a lot harder. It would seem a lot harder to say that all of the micro states would be exactly the same, but that the macro state could have worked out differently. I was wondering, would you agree that there exists that asymmetry? And if so, what does that asymmetry tell us about maybe a priority? of the micro versus the priority of the macro, if anything. Well, insofar as we're talking about top-down causation, we're talking about causal power vested in a thing in virtue of its form or organization. Insofar as it's a form or organization that uh, gives the thing its causal power, then we can replace the bits of the thing within limits, of course, and still have the same organization. That is, it doesn't really matter which hydrogen atom goes into the water molecule. What matters is that the hydrogen and the oxygen are organized in a certain way, and it's that organization that gives the molecule the causal powers specific to water molecules. So uh, that's right that there's um, that sort of relation between the micro level and the macro level. But um, what I think it shows is simply the point that I was at pains to highlight in the lecture, which is also now, uh, what do I say, being pushed by many people who work in philosophy of the sciences or who work in metaphysics, and that is that causal power should be understood to be a function of the whole and should not be understood to be a function of the parts taken seriatim. With regard to that principle applied to the human person, would it run something like we are neither a brain nor the electricity which runs through the brain, where um, we are the organization of both in the, in the form? Is it, 
or how would you um, how would you relate that to the person? So I think this is what you're asking me. Could there be human intellection in the absence of a brain? Is that what you're asking? Um, I think I'm more asking how exactly does the principle of uh, of um, us not being uh, reducible to our parts, but us being um, us being uh, animated by form. How does that relate to uh, humans in particular? The principle applies to human beings also. It's the organization of the human being as a whole that vests in the human being the ability to have cognition and to act in accordance with that cognition by will. So it's not uh, that your ability to know or desire is a function of the elementary particles working from the bottom up. Rather, it's the organization of the whole that gives you these cognitive capacities. But I have a feeling I don't understand your question, and I would like you to try it one more time to see if I can see what it is that's um, animating me here. I think I was thinking, um, so, where, where do people um, go wrong in particular if they say that if uh, basically if someone says that a human is um, it's just a material brain animated by uh, I suppose you could say um, the particles of electricity that run through the brain and it's nothing more than that um, uh, how, how would you uh, what would you say about the relationship between electricity and the brain I would say that any time a person says A is nothing but B, you've got somebody who's trying to take away from you the A you like and foist on you the B you don't like on the grounds that they are the same. But the very fact that you don't like B and you do like A indicates that they are not just the same, at least not the same to you. So that very form of discourse by itself, you might say, invalidates itself, since if they were just the same, it would be odd if you like one as much as you do and dislike the other one as much as you do. See what I mean? So it's a, it, once somebody begins by saying A is nothing but B, there is some reason to begin with a somewhat skeptical attitude. Now, in the case of human beings, um, and, and in the case of Christianity's view of human beings, I would say uh, something like this. Christianity is committed to two claims which seem incompatible with each other. Both of them are in the biblical book Ecclesiastes. The first claim is this. Do you, know what, do you know what day it is on Wednesday in the liturgical cycle for Christians? Do you know what day this is? Yes, that would be Ash Wednesday. And what do we say on Ash Wednesday? I like it in the old King James. Thus thou art, O oh man, and unto dust shalt thou return. And it brings the point home. So, so that line, you might say, is an indication that on Christian principles, you're a material object and you are made out of matter. I mean, dust is matter. There's no getting around that. See what I mean? So, so that's one of the Christian principles. And the other one in Ecclesiastes says that at death, the dust returns to the earth from which it came and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Now, you might think to yourself, look, if a human being is a material object made out of matter, then how could there be anything not made out of matter that returns to God at death? How is that possible? And Aquinas' answer goes something like this. He says, um, for higher human capacity, for higher human cognitive capacity, you don't need any material object. You only need a certain configuration. You only need the form. Now you might think to yourself, well, he didn't know any neuroscience, did he? Too bad for him. But actually, um, if you think about what he's trying to say with those words, you'll see that he's actually completely right. So in neuroscience, there has been a great debate between the locationists and the non-locationists. <coughs> so when I was an undergraduate, Everybody was taking poor beasts 
and cutting out parts of their brains to see which part of the brain, for example, moved the thumb. <coughs> Look for the location that was the thumb moving location in the brain. And they discovered this uh, odd thing, which has now been amply confirmed all over the place. Cut out the part of the brain that moves the thumb, wait a little while, and the thumb will move again. It turns out that if you're blind from birth, and you learn how to read by braille, then the occipital lobe of the brain, which processes vision, will process touch, just the touch you use for braille reading. Now you think to yourself, look, if that's the part for vision, how in the world can it be used for touch? And the answer is, it's all in the configuration. It's the configuration. Since it is the configuration that does the job, it is hard to know on what basis you would suppose that the intellect couldn't exist without this particular matter. Beg your pardon for a very ugly and horrible example, which you might not like, but if I gouge out your eyes, you won't see. That is the end of the story, because you need that lump of flesh in order to see. But if we cut out, if we cut out in ferrets, the part of the brain that is involved in seeing, the ferret can actually use the part of the brain used in hearing to see. And now, and now, we have devices that help human beings blind from birth see by means of sensors on the tongue, using the sense of taste, the, 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 the part of the brain used for taste, in order to get visual awareness of the world. It's the organization. So you might say to yourself, look, there can't be organization without matter that it confers. But if you think so, you must think that you have a proof for the non-existence of God. Because God is a form without matter. <coughs> and let me tell you, <coughs> proofs for the non-existence of God are hard to come by. <laughs> so I would say that those two claims of Ecclesiastes, that you are made out of matter, but that there is a spirit that can return to the God who gave it as death, these are compatible claims, and there is nothing in contemporary neuroscience or contemporary metaphysics that rules them out. And Falkenhorn says that uh, the denial of freedom is incoherent because the mate itself <laughs> assumes it. In other words, the participants in a debate all assume that they are free to assess the veracity or otherwise of what's being said. This, he says, after a lengthy discussion about the soul as the form of the body, which is exactly what you have been saying. Have you any comment to make on that? Is, is, freedom, is the rejection of freedom ultimately incoherent? Well, you know, I would say Polkinghorn is a braver man than I am in making that claim. The world has a lot of very, very clever attempts to defend the position that Polkinghorn says is incoherent. I think the position he says is incoherent is a false position, has false claims, but to say it's incoherent is saying a whole lot. Now, having made that statement, I should add that Al Plantinga is famous for an argument in which he attempts to show something sort of like this, that uh, naturalism defeats itself because it cannot account for the use of reason in the establishment of naturalism, something like that. But that's a highly controversial argument of Plantinga's, and there are endless numbers of articles attempting to show why the argument doesn't work. So I'm just saying that's a pretty bold and brassy claim, and I wouldn't go that far myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I have just a very simple question. If the personal is the foundation of reality, should we then restrict explanation to causal interaction? If God cajoles, threatens, instructs, asks questions, and so on, there seems to be more involved than just causal interaction. And couldn't it be that reductionism does not only involve reducing everything to the lowest level, 
but also reducing everything to one level of explanation, namely causal interaction. So uh -huh. It seems to me that lots of phenomena in biology, for example, have to do with communica communicative interaction, decoding and encoding, like our Im immune system works, for example. Mm -hmm. So that there is, in fact, more than just one kind of explanation. And, in fact, your example of autism seems to um, point into the same direction. Yeah, I'm not, I'm very unsure what to say about that. All of these questions are excellent questions, and I like all of them very much, and I like this question in particular, and I'm not sure what to say about it. So for us, I mean, let me just start like this. For us, when we say causation, we mean efficient causation. For the medievals, there are four ways to answer the question why, which is what our question about causation is trying to answer, why. Four kinds of answer, and only one of them is efficient causation. The others, as you know, are formal, final, and material causation. And none of those three would count as causation in our sense of causation. So on this Aristotelian medieval view, the answer to your question is sure. There's a lot of interaction that isn't, that isn't efficient causal interaction. What's giving me hesitation is the way you presented the question in terms of interaction. Depending on what we mean by interaction, it may be that the, the phenomena your question calls attention to are just those parts of reality where there is efficient causa causation. So I don't know, I have to think a little more about what you mean by, by interaction. But certainly, as far as explanation of what there is in the world go, I think uh, it's quite right that there's more by way uh, of uh, explananda than efficient causation. That seems to me right. Hi. Um, so before I ask my question, I'd uh, just like to make sure I've got your argument right, that I'm not misrepresenting it. Um, so you are um, arguing that um, it's the configuration for, say, an H2O molecule that is important um, because if you look down at the individual atoms, there's nothing about those atoms that um, guarantees the properties of the molecule itself. You could swap them out individually um, with no real changes to the bigger picture. Is that correct? No. <laughs> Good thing you were so cautious and asked first. No. The, the point is that when the components come together in the molecule, they lose the configuration that they had outside the molecule. They become configured differently within the molecule. They are organized within the water molecule, water molecule fashion. And it's that organization that gives a water molecule its ability to form hydrogen bonds. I need to tell you that if there's a chemist in the audience, I will immediately have to cave to whatever the chemist says because I know very little chemistry. I've got a good competence in uh, biology and neuroscience, a moderate competence in physics, and very little competence in chemistry. But even I get the point about the water molecule. So the water molecule's configuration is what gives it the causal power to form hydrogen bonds, and that configuration, that configuration, of course, depends on the way in which each hydrogen atom and each oxygen atom is configured. That is, if oxygen didn't have the electrons it had, or hydrogen didn't have the structure it had, the water molecule couldn't have the structure it has. That is, the elementary bits explain how it gets the water molecule configuration it gets. But it's that configuration which gives the causal power. Right, OK. And so these configurations have an emergent property that you wouldn't be able to predict um, from the atoms themselves without um, like prior knowledge. What counts as emergent property is a subject of enormous debate in contemporary metaphysics. And depending on whose view of emergent property you take, the answer to your question will differ. So some people think of emergence as a matter of uh, epistemology, it's what you can't predict. Some people take it as a matter of ontology, something new comes into existence. 
Um, I myself think about it in the way I have just explained. So I think of emergence not in either of those two ways exactly, but in this way, the uh, form of the whole grants the whole a causal property which none of the parts taken in isolation would have, and therefore the causal power emerges from the coming together into a whole of these constituent bits. But you could predict it in advance in some cases, or you could, I don't know what to say, explain it on the basis of what you know on the lower level. So you don't have to have either of those two other understandings of emergence from my position. Thanks. I just wanted to ask, um, so configurations themselves are fairly um, non-spooky things. They're spatio-temporal relations and this kind of thing. Um, so couldn't you be a reductionist by saying, look, we, have, we can explain um, molecules, uh, or we can explain certain kinds of um, phenomena by appealing to um, the configuration and the particles, but that's still fully reductionistic in that we're just broadening the reductionistic base. Um, so that's one kind of view that you might have where it's basically particles with some configurations in there and that gets you all the explanatory power you want. Um, another option would be to say that actually um, it's, the, it's it being a molecule that explains the configuration and not the particles being in a certain configuration that explains it being a molecule. I think one of those is, is, um, is more reductionistic than the other and I'm just curious as to which one um, you're more sympathetic with. Well, I'm not sure I understand the second option very well, but for the first option, so I would say it's not a reductionist option at all. You're thinking it's reductionist because you're thinking like this, reductionism is somehow physicalist, physicalist is somehow natural, there's nothing spooky about a water molecule, so you can explain a water molecule in an Aristotelian sense and not be a reductionist. But that's not really what we're fighting about over reduction. What we're fighting about, in a sense, is whether or not you're going to allow organization as a separate, independent constituent in your ontology. That's what we're fighting about. So that a reductionist is not going to accept that configuration is part of the ontology of the water molecule. Now, it is true that if you reject reductionism for water molecules, you have nothing spooky. Too true. Nothing spooky. That's why I said you can be an atheist and reject reductionism. And my examples uh, of people rejecting reductionism included atheists, John Dupre, for example. But the point is really this. It's the, as I said at the end, atheism is compatible with the rejection of reductionism. But the thing to notice is this. If you will accept in your ontology organization, as a metaphysical something, which is not itself made out of matter. The organization is not made out of matter. You have now admitted into your ontology, without risk of the spooky, something immaterial. Once you have gone this far in, in, in the divergence from that secular scientific picture, then the question is, in a certain sense, this. You no longer have to try to build your whole worldview around the idea that all we've got is elementary particles of matter and what they make up. That's all we can admit in our ontology. Once you let go of that, your ontology makes room for the immaterial. It doesn't require it but it doesn't rule it out in the same way it did before. And that's the point.